Okay, thank you. So um, I will talk a bit about the Muon Collider and the collaboration uh, on behalf of the collaboration. So for the physics case, you will get all the details uh, in the next talk. Uh, to say that uh, lepton physics with high energy is of interest certainly because it combines uh, precision and discovery uh, potential. And precision potential like measuring uh, the Higgs coupling, uh, self coupling, uh, and so on. And also, one could say that for many particles, the discovery reach of a lepton collider is a factor of seven or maybe 10 uh, larger compared for the same energy uh, compared to a proton uh, machine. Now, in order to achieve that, one needs actually a luminosity that increases with energy, with the square of energy, because the cross sections go down as one over the square of energy. And uh, so we have actually a defined luminosity goal, which now we hope we get feedback on from the physics. Uh, you find the, the goal there. And you, you can compare, for example, the, the highest lepton collider proposed so far, uh, click at 3 TV, has a luminosity that's actually um, uh, comparable to that. It's factored three times higher, but only one third of the click luminosity is at full standard of mass energy. So which lepton colliders actually have been proposed in the European strategy in Granada? There have been more proposed later in the, the US, but maybe less that. So all of these proposals have a CDR. So, so they are designed at some level, they have a cost estimate, which we may trust at different levels, but at least uh, they are reasonably mature. And you can see that there are the circular lepton colliders, be it FCCE or uh, CEPC, but the luminosity that drops dramatically as we increase the uh, beam energy. And so like around 400 GB, uh, that's like the highest energy you can do in the roughly 100 kilometer ton, 98.7 uh, kilometer ton. And then you have linear colliders, predict six out is going up to three TV and well, uh, 3TV we think is possible. But if you look at the cost of that collider, it's 18 billion gigaspace francs, all three stages, 3AT, 1.5 TV, and 3TV integrated. And it has a power consumption of almost 600 megawatts. So it becomes similar to the FCCHH, uh, which is 24 uh, gigaspace francs, and also roughly 600 megawatts of uh, power consumption. So it's quite expensive. And if you want to go to higher energies, this uh, will be not sustainable easily. So what limits the energy? This is not new, but I just show it uh, anyway. Uh, electron positron rings are multipass, so, so that's very convenient. You, you can X-ray the, the, the beam in many stages and you can collide it very often, uh, but because of synchrotron radiation, you lose energy. And like in lab, at 200, uh, a bit more than 200 mass, actually 5% of the beam energy were lost per turn. So it's quite important. Uh, that's why proton rings are the energy frontier, why the LHC is the energy frontier, because due to the higher mass. Now, linear colliders <laughs> is a way to avoid synchrotron radiation. It's very good at that, but it's single pass. So, so you have to get all the acceleration in one go, and you can collide the beam only once. And that means, well, to first order, the cost of the machine increases linearly with energy and the luminosity. I will not show you the calculation here. Um, the power consumption is roughly proportional to luminosity. So as you go up in energy, the cost increases linearly and the power consumption with the square to get the luminosity. So the way out could be muons because they are heavy. So you can use a circular collider uh, and that's great. The only thing that's bad is that the muons have a limited lifetime of two or two microseconds, which increases with energy certainly, but this is at rest and it makes the design hard. Otherwise it would be totally trivial. Um, the collider looks like this. This is from the US collaboration, the MAP collaboration, because this has been studied in the US in the past. Uh, you have a proton uh, complex where you produce very short, intense proton bunches uh, by with the LENAC. And you, you compress the bunches in a number of systems and some rings and some combiner systems. And then you send that bunch into a target where it produces pions. The pions decay. And a part of the pions produces muons, which you then collect in this decay channel, you bunch them and you rotate them in phase so they get a nice bunch. Now the bunch is still very hot because it comes from a shower. And what you have to do is you have to cool it. And because the muons don't live very long, you cannot do that in a damping ring as you would do in a linear collider, but you rather go through matter. And in the matter, you do the cooling. I come back to that. And so what you do is you decrease the phase space very rapidly. Actually, first you decrease it, then you combine 
sort of several bunch lives, uh, you, you cool again. And after that, you accelerate first in a Linux to be rapid, in a recirculating Linux, and then in a ring to full energy. And then at full energy, you collide the beams in the uh, cryon. Now, the US design actually did not have a CDR, so there's no coherent baseline with no cost estimate. And they did not go to energies uh, above three TV. There was something at six, and, and but it wasn't really serious. There was no design for that. But in spite of all of that, we didn't see anything that would prevent us, as far as we know, from going there. So we need more detailed studies for this. Uh, just a word on luminosity. Here you see the luminosity of click as a function. So it's luminosity divided by the beam power as a function of center of mass energy. And you see it's a constant. Theoretically, it's expected to be that. It, it's not quite constant because of some radiation effects in the fine focus. While for a muon collider, actually what happens is that the luminosity per beam power increases linearly with energy. And you see that at very low energies, this would be a low value, but above two or three TV, this becomes very, very competitive and at higher energies, even better compared to a linear collider. And so that's why the European strategy advised to study, uh, to, to consider a muon collider. So based on that, um, collaboration is forming. And the objective is that in time for the next European strategy, so within five years, roughly, uh, we would want to establish whether the investment into a full CDR is justified scientifically and uh, what the demonstrator could look like. So because you need to understand the cost of the demonstration program and we don't feel ready to invest the full amount you need for a CDR now but we want to identify whether or not this is justified scientifically. If then the strategy, the European strategy wants that, it's another issue. And we will focus on three energies, uh, on two energies, so three TV, which is to compare to click and a good initial energy because it has already a strong physics case well beyond anything that a superconducting Linux can do and the Higgs factory can do. And then 10 plus TV to really explore something that's way beyond even what normal conducting uh, Linux can do. For plasma colliders, I don't want to discuss that here, but certainly luminosity limitations also apply to them. Uh, and then we want to explore synergies with other projects or options like a neutrino or Higgs factory. The neutrino factory could be a good candidate for a test facility. On the way, the Higgs factory looks less attractive because there are good technologies, mature technologies available now. And then we need to define the R&D path. Uh, this is the potential long-term timeline, first five years would be to make a baseline design um, for the collider so that one is ready to decide if the test facility could be done. One would design in the second part of this period the a test facility and also some models. And after these five years, the European strategy could recommend to implement the test facility and then use it to make a CDR and also to do technology developments. After that, one would be ready to commit because one knows the cost, one understands that the thing is viable and one needs to make a technical design. And then uh, four years later, one could go into approval. Technically limited, so that means infinite resources, um, which we probably will not have, so it might stretch a bit. Uh, in Europe, that's also important, the European strategy charged, or they, they proposed to develop an R&D uh, roadmap for accelerators. And um, council has charged the lab directors group, which represents CNRS, CR, uh, um, INFN, STFC, PSI, um, CERN, uh, DAISY, I'm probably missing some, but the major laboratories of uh, Europe. And uh, so, so they will report to the council by the end of this year. And uh, they are supposed to put all of the different um, groups together. So there is a muon beam panel, there's also a plasma acceleration panel. And what it should do is develop, among other things, a prioritized work plan taking account the capabilities and interests of the stakeholders. So, so that will be uh, the goal for this year. And based on that, there will be a set of scenarios uh, for different engagements into the different uh, options, ranging from minimal to maximum. OK, so this is certainly the most critical one for this year. And it will come from council. So it will really come from the highest body that we have in, in Europe. The luminosity goal. As I said before, it goes with the square of the energy. So at 3 TV would be one inverse autobahn. And then at 14 TV, the 10 plus, maybe being 14, uh, would be 20 inverse autobahn. Um, 
this is reasonably conservatively achievable within five years with a parameter list on the right, which we have developed based on the work on the previous map work. So, so it's using these parameters, uh, sort of extrapolating them to high energies. So but that would take roughly five years. Now in practice, might we might need to add some margins and so it might take a little longer, but within the reasonable project lifetime, these integrated numbers can be achieved. For comparison, the FCCHH assumes to operate for 25 years to get the integrated luminosity. Before, until last year, I've been in charge of the FCCHH uh, collider design. Um, we aim to have two detectors, but we cannot promise for the, on the train radiation issues. I come back to that later. And um, again, we will mainly focus on three and 10. For comparison, the 14 TV muon collider has less beam power uh, than click at three TV. So this is the strength you see that the ratio, I mean, it has a look much higher luminosity, but much uh, less beam power than click would have. Uh, this is the luminosity scanning from your collider, which is nice to derive, but I don't want to bother you with that. Um, so the luminosity is proportional to the energy. That's great. That comes for free. Proportional to the magnetic field in the collider ring. The higher the field, the smaller the ring, the more collisions you get out of muon before it dies. The energy acceptance of the ring, the larger the energy acceptance, the shorter the bunch can be and the smaller the beam can become transversely. The phase-based density, so charge divided by the emittance, the phase of the bunch. So we want a very dense beam at the source. And then actually the next is the rep rate, the charge per bunch and the energy. So, so this is the beam power. So certainly that always helps. And what we need is a constant current because then naturally the luminosity scales uh, with the square of the energy and the beam power scales up linearly uh, with energy. So perfect. So that's better than linear colliders. Uh, linearly. In the exploratory phase, so in the first two years, what we uh, need to work on most is the physics potential evaluation because nobody fully studied the 10 TV option, what it can do. There are some initial studies, but people still debate how that compares like to a Hadron Collider or to uh, the three TV case and so on. The impact on the environment, we come back to that, especially the radiation produced by neutrinos to the public, power consumption certainly and some other systems. Um, um, the impact of the machine induced background on the detector, I will not say so much as we are still in the process of developing that. Um, the high energy systems, which will limit the energy reach because uh, as I show the, the source will stay the same, but the high energy systems change. And then the quality, uh, the, the production of a high quality beam, which is mainly the target and the cooling afterwards and the proton complex. So let's have a look at how that uh, works. So the first part up to the end of the cooling, we consider it to be the same for all energies. And uh, this is because we in the design go basically to what we think the limits of the design capabilities are of the technology and the physics. And then what comes after is an accelerator. And certainly as we go up in energy, this accelerator ring has to become larger. It's actually larger than uh, what we have in the collider ring. So for example, for a 10 uh, TV accelerator, this ring could be like the, the size of the LHC. It could also, um, uh, in, in comparison, the, the collider ring would be roughly half the size of the LHC at um, 10 TV, just to give you an, uh, actually, no, at 14 TV, even at 10 TV would be like 10 kilometers, maybe in circumference, so less than half. Okay, and those systems need to be efficient and also cost effective because otherwise we run into the problem that we have a nice design and maybe cannot afford it. So let's go a little bit so, so that you get the feel for how realistic the collider is because I think that's really the key to it and most people see that this is a challenge. So there's the source and there you have an intense proton beam which is challenging to produce but we think it can be done with systems that had been considered for the LHC so we will explore that a little more. Uh, you will have a target which takes 1.3 megawatts of proton beam power. So I put some stress on it. And then you have a very high field solenoid around that. And it's an ambitious solenoid in terms of the field, but also because of all of the, these uh, 1.3 megawatts, a part of that actually goes transversely into the solenoid. And so you have to protect the solenoid from the radiation because of its lifetime so that it doesn't quench. So that's very challenging. And you have certainly a fraction of this power going downstream and potentially damaging the machine after. A much higher, higher power target has been demonstrated based on liquid mercury. The problem many years ago at CERN 
The problem with that is that for safety reasons, maybe now one needs a solid target. Uh, it could be uh, like carbon or maybe tungsten in a sort of a fluid. So it would be like little bullets that would be dust that would be a sort of pseudo fluid. Um, but we think this is challenging, but possible. The cooling. So the concept is very neat because muons don't interact with matter easily. Except that uh, they do um, uh, multiple scattering certainly, and they they have uh, energy loss due to ionization. So what you do is you have uh, absorbers, and you send the particles through the absorber. So here you see the particle with its momentum in black. It goes through the absorber, loses energy, and that means it radiates transverse momentum and longitudinal momentum at the same time. And then you accelerate afterwards in a cavity. And so you just put back longitudinal momentum. And by that, you reduce the transverse momentum more and more, and the beam cools as it should, like in a damping ring, but much faster. Now, the problem with that is it's very great. So, so you have the, the change of emittance as a function of length, and it is decreasing because of the energy loss. But then there is a multiple scattering, which is increasing the emittance again because the particles do multiple scattering. And now what we need is this increasing term can be reduced by having very strong focusing solenoids to minimize the beta function. This is the beam beta function at the absorbers. And so, so we look for unprecedented fields. I would like 50 Tesla. City have been demonstrated. So, so let's see how far we can go. And we need highest gradients, 50 megawatts per meter or so, because this needs to be very, very short and condensed because the muons die all the time. And they need to be also within the solenoid to save space. So this is very ambitious. but Things have been demonstrated roughly in that. What would happen now with the emittance, just to show you, this is the emittance of the target. Horizontally, you have the transverse phase space, and vertically, you have the longitudinal phase space. And so what you do is you, you first do your sort of all these rotations, and then you go through the first cooling stage, and you reduce both emittances. And then you combine the number of bunches into one fat one. So it has to become larger, because the, the phase space density cannot increase. You can just make the total bigger phase space and charge together. And then you cool further. And then at some point, you have a very nice uh, small uh, phase space. But then you have to increase it. Uh, you have to decrease it transversely more. So you have to go here. And you, you let it go in the, in the longitudinal, because actually you cannot profit so much from the, the short longitudinal. Uh, so that's the, the plan. And you, you see here how that maps into the system. Actually, it's inversed in order to, to, to what we had before. <laughs> so you come from the right with, with the beam. Now, this has been simulated, and it's all fine, except that um, if you look at the final stage you, in the simulation, you go here. So, so you are better than what you thought you would be. But then the final stage did not, in simulation, achieve the full performance. And I think that's mainly due to the solenoid being only 30 Tesla and not 40 or so. Um, so with a higher field solenoid, and that's actually one of the subjects that uh, well, in this case, CR, I'm afraid that CNS might be interested in uh, is to work on that. And maybe there are some other clever ideas. Uh, the components that we would need for that actually have been looked at and things have been achieved. So there are HTS high field cables uh, developed um, at uh, Fermilab. Uh, there was actually a solenoid at 32 Tesla demonstrated. It's very impressive. And now people try to go even higher. There was acceleration of 50 megawatts per meter proven in five Tesla field. This is enormous because normally you don't want to operate the cavity in a field. This is a very high field. And for a normal conducting low frequency cavity, this is enormous. So they, these cavities are either gas filled or made with beryllium to, to achieve these fields. And then there are very fast ramping uh, HTS magnets with 12 Tesla per second. This is enormous. I mean, the LHC to ramp up takes uh, half an hour or something. And here we talk about so sort of the LHC would ramp in less than a second at that rate. I mean, OK. Um, the, the overall cooling also has been demonstrated in mice in the UK. So that setup actually has a, a muon beam coming from the side here. And then you have some absorber, liquid uh, hydrogen, for example, or lithium hydride, both uh, have tried in the middle. And you measure the phase space chain of the muons. Now, that's. The problem is that there were limited resources, so they, they did the best they, they can do with the resources and simulations and uh, experiment agree very well, but um, you, you cannot, I mean, there were very few muons and you, you cannot get um, huge statistics and certainly you have only one short stage. 
But what they, they get, you can see here on the lower plot, the green curve is the particle distribution after the position of the absorber. And on the upper one, it's if you don't have the absorber. So, so you see, this is the distribution and the, the whatever that is, beige, uh, whatever one is the initial distribution of the muons. Now, if you put the absorber in, you see that the distribution changes and you get more particles at low amplitudes and fewer at high amplitude, which you don't see so well here because this is like they are fed in from this tail here. So, so this shape doesn't change so much. But what happens is that particles that have larger amplitudes get to a smaller amplitude due to the cooling process. So you can see that like on an individual particle distribution. Perfect, very neat experiment. It has been published in Nature. Okay, it's a little bit cut off here uh, last year. Now you come to the acceleration. And um, as we say, this is maybe the, the costly part. So there's initially some Linux and then comes the ring that does the acceleration to full energy because this collider ring shouldn't change its field. Um, because the beam lives only a fraction of a second in the collider ring, so, so we cannot run it up and down. So um, there are Linux or recirculating Linux, typically a sequence, and then FFAGs, which are now called FFAs by the UK people. I, okay, so these are static rings using superconducting magnets um, here, but you, you can tolerate very large energy variations of the particles. So, so the beams go around even at very different energies, they still go around this uh, Linux, uh, this Linux, sorry, this um, ring. The problem with that is these designs are very difficult for the magnets and for the lattice, but demonstrations of such a principle have been done. And then you could also use a ring where you pulse the magnets up in field as the beam energy increases in this ring. And then you would pulse the magnets up to follow the, the beam energy and extract the beams at full energy into your collider ring. So these are different options. Now, Having a look at uh, the rapid cycling synchrotron, so that's the one where you ramp up the magnets. Normally, it's very difficult to use superconducting magnets at these rates, so you would use normal conducting magnets. And then you can have like two Tesla, so the ring would become quite large for the three TV collider. It could fit into the LHC tunnel, 26.7 kilometers, but you can also make it somewhat smaller by using a trick. And the trick is you merge or you, you, you mix superconducting magnets with fast ramping normal uh, conducting dipoles. And then you power them first so that the, the fast ramping ones work against the superconducting ones. So the superconducting ones keeps the beam on orbit going around and right away. And first you, you have your fast ramping ones work opposite to that. And then you ramp them down and up to the other side. And by that you, you go from a very small effective field to, to a larger one. And more or less you double the range of your magnets. And so you can half the size of your ring. That's roughly what it is. Um, you need to do that in milliseconds, so it's quite ambitious. And one of the challenges, for example, is that the stored energy in your field, in a magnetic field, is at 14 TV, 200 megajoules. So you, you pulse them up and down uh, about five times a second, uh, times two. So you, you talk about two gigajoule floating around every second. So you, you have to recover this energy and store it and reuse it. Otherwise, you, you, you would have two uh, gigawatts of power consumption. Um, so that's a, one of the challenges we have to work on. And then uh, there are FFAGs, which have a difficult lattice design, as I said. And the RF is also challenging because the, the muon bunch has 10 times the charge of a high lumi bunch. So you have to be efficient with that. You, you have to design the cavities carefully. And that's very interesting work. In the collidering, one of the features that we have is we want to make it as small as possible. So we go for the highest field magnets up to 16 Tesla uh, at full energy. At 3 TV, maybe we want to stay with lower field magnets like nibium, uh, titanium, 8 Tesla or something, because then the technology is available nowadays and it could be still cost effective because for the nibium 3 tin magnets, the cost in the moment is very, very high. That has to be brought down in the next, in the, the coming decades. And so maybe we want to reserve that for the uh, final energy and not for, for the 3 TV. It may not be necessary. Then the muons all die. And when they die, they decay into uh, an electron or a positron and two neutrinos. And the electron or positron takes roughly one third on average of the energy of the muon. And it gets lost in the machine because it's lost somewhere around the ring. And that's of the order of 400, 500 watts per meter. And 
that needs to be, I mean, the magnet needs to be protected from that because the magnet can only take a few watts per meter as a heat load. Otherwise, it will become non superconducting and quench. And so this uh, needs some shielding of tanks inside and a large aperture. And then we also need very strong focusing at the IP. And the other problem is that as we go up in energy, the focusing has to become stronger. And typically, we would actually, like in FCCHH, the beta function is at the IP is larger than in LHC. So the focusing can be less strict at the high energy because it becomes more difficult because the beam is stiffer. But here we need to make it even tighter as we go up in energy. So, so this is a huge challenge for the magnet design, but we are confident that this can be addressed. Okay. Um, for the detector, we have some uh, tentative performance specifications. Because the 10 plus TV is really uncharted territory. And what we did do is uh, devise a Delphis card that's based on performances from Click and from FCCHH. So those could be um, used for, uh, for theoretical studies. And it's also a good goal for the detector designers to ensure that these performances can be reached or to see how close we can come. And uh, here is a link you, you can see to actually uh, the, all the information on this Delphis card on our uh, Mion Collider webpage. And now the goal is for the detector studies to verify that this can be achieved and for the physics studies to use that to show the physics performance. The detector, um, we don't have yet a from scratch detector design for the Mion Collider, but we have a study uh, by uh, Donatella Lucchese and uh, her team using a click detector as a basis because the click 3TV detector is the closest single detector to what you might need in a muon collider with some modifications. And the main modification is that you need some shielding on the inside of your detector. And you, you can see that here, it's a nozzle which is mainly made from tungsten. And the reason is that all these um, muons that decay, they produce their electrons or positrons and those will go into your detector or they will be scattering somewhere and will typically be lost somewhat before your detector because of the mag uh, magnetic field in these uh, magnets. And the rate would be at 3 TV, 200,000 per meter and bunch crossing. So quite a high number. As you go up in energy, the number goes down as one over the energy, but the energy in each of the particles goes up as the energy. So the, uh, the watts per meter is the same independent of energy. And there have been simulations now at one and a half TV uh, with Fluka and Line Builder, and they are compared to previous results from the S uh, done with Mars. And you can see here uh, in yellow all the lines, all the tracks that are produced coming from actually the uh, IP area. And I think most of them will start at the nozzles. So this is something you have to study if you can distinguish them from the rest of the back of the from the event by having a different origin than the event itself. That's quite interesting. Now, we will have to do the study also at high energies, but we don't have yet the designs at high energy. So that's why I will not go into too much detail on this, but we are ready to do that. And hopefully by the end of this year, we can, uh, we will have more information. But the lattice design also takes some time and people want to do a good job. I mean, they have to understand everything before they would release something uh, before, uh, for further studies. Now, I was mentioning there is one important problem, which is the neutrino radiation. You might have heard about that. It's, for my mind, maybe the worst problem of the Mion Collider because it's, except it's, uh, it affects the acceptance by the public. And that certainly is uh, critical. What happens is that when uh, your muons decay, you produce two neutrinos. And they go straight into a very small cone because basically the opening of the cone is one over gamma. It's actually even slightly tighter on that. They go in the forward direction and they have a very small probability of scattering on nuclei. And because of their concentration, because of this very high flux, this is sufficient to actually produce some field, so some radiation at the area where they, they exit the surface of the, the Earth. And that can be comparable to the natural uh, radiation that you have in a location. So um, in the direction of the straight, this is certainly the worst because you have many of the neutrinos going all in the same direction, all along the, the straight line. So the idea there is that we would actually buy the land to which you point. 
or you try to point one of the sides maybe into the sea in open sea. So for the straits, you, you might find a solution, but you still have some radiation from all the arcs. And that radiation actually increases with the third power of the energy. If you increase your luminosity with the square of the energy, and you can see that here in the formula from Bruce King, there is the energy to the third term in there. And then it can be mitigated by going deeper into the Earth, but only linearly with the depth. And it becomes very difficult if you go deeper because it becomes more expensive. Your shafts become very expensive. And also the ground in the Geneva Basin is less good there. And so um, we need to do something. Whoops. OK, so sorry, there is uh, something uh, not really deleted as it should, should be. Um, so what can we do about that? And um, first of all, there is a formula which relates now the dose to, I uh, mean, the dose divided by the integrated luminosity to the different collider parameters, and it's proportional to the energy. And then uh, it depends on the magnetic field. So, so the higher the magnetic field in the, ma in the magnets of the ox is the better to the depth and to the phase-based density. It's the inverse of the phase-based density. So if you can make, a denser beam, we would win in the radiation. Now, what you can legally accept is one millisievert per year to the public. That's what legally is possible in most countries. It's true for the US. I think it's true in Europe everywhere in Switzerland. The goal of the MAP study was to stay at 10% of that, 0.1 millisievert. However, we think that we should go for something that's below 10 microsievert. And the reason is, in that case, you don't need approval from the legislation. In that case, you are considered to, to be a, a negligible source of radiation. And actually, it is comparable to what the LHC achieves. Now, I have found different numbers for the LHC. So the five microsievert is maybe even a slightly optimistic number, but it's of that order. And we can compare for our arc at 10 and 14 TV. And we would find that even at 500 meter depth, which is quite deep, something of the order of 100 or even 300 microsievert. You see how quickly it goes up. So that's certainly higher than what we want. And if we don't have magnets everywhere, but if you have some distance without field between two dipoles, then uh, only 20 centimeters, that would increase this radiation by about a factor three, as you can see with the lower numbers. So that was one of the real limitations of the muon collider. So our idea to deal with that is to actually move the, the beam because its angle, its opening angle is just a few micro radians. And so the idea is to, in time, at one spot, to actually move uh, the beams. So, so that points up and down very slowly. And you would change that linearly in a range of, say, plus one minus, uh, plus minus uh, one milli radian. If you do that, well, uh, you would, uh, even with the 14 TV collider, and at 200 meter depth, which is perfectly reasonable, be at around five microsievert per year. So you would be in the regime where this is becoming negligible and comparable to other machines and something that doesn't need uh, dedicated approval. And you would achieve that by actually moving the, the components of your machine. So what you see here is a 1200 meter long piece. You would use 1% of your horizontal bending power in the vertical. And by that, you would create pieces of parabola with 15 centimeter total amplitude. And you would wiggle the, uh, the neutrino beam would move um, with uh, two in total milli radian uh, full, full amplitude. Now, this can be done slowly because all of these doses uh, limits are uh, valid for one year, integrated over one year. But we need to study the technical aspects of that and the, the impact on the beam. But for that, we hope we can even in the Geneva area have such a slide. OK, uh, before I conclude, there is a final proposal that initially was debated very strongly, which is the lemma scheme, where actually you don't use protons on the target to generate muons, but you use positrons. And the idea is shown here. You have a Linux with positrons or some other positron facility. That doesn't really matter. You send the beam through a target. And then what you do is that you collect some muons that are produced and you circulate them in a ring through the target about 2,000 times or so. So the ring would be like 60 meters circumference. 
And each time when the muon bunch goes through the target, you have another positron bunch arriving. And so each time you, you add a few muons to the beam. And that is nice because this allows you to put the new muons into the same phase space as the old ones. It's the only way you can do that. You can never do that in vacuum or so. You, you, you need, in this case, the production in that. Uh, so, so that was the idea. And the, the goal was to have a very small uh, emittance muon beam so that the phase space density could be very high. However, we did not find uh, any realistic parameters for now. So, so uh, this, uh, for the moment, um, needs uh, some some new inventions to make it uh, really something that can have a luminosity that is uh, of use. OK, so in conclusion, the muon collider is a unique, promising option, the highest lepton energies. Many people think it's probably the only lepton collider that can go to very high energies. But a reasonable luminosity. That will be the challenge for the plasma colliders to get luminosity. We need to fully explore the physics case because it goes well beyond what has been uh, done for click. And we have to address the feasibility, which is uh, to ensure that the beam induced background is not an obstacle. So these studies have started. They, the first studies at one and a half TV look promising, but we have to extend that to higher energies. And we have to uh, devise a program in the European roadmap for accelerator R&D that is um, addressing the, the machine issues. There's a web page uh, with a link there and mailing list to which you can subscribe. You just have to go to this eGroups uh, web page at CERN and then in principle, you should be allowed to subscribe yourself to these mailing lists. And I would like to thank all the people that uh, helped with this, the MAP collaboration because they provided uh, so much input that they broke the ground initially, the MICE collaboration, uh, the LEMA team, and then uh, certainly the European strategy update and the collaboration that is forming for the volume on collider right now. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for the very nice talk. Uh, and now, well, I, we can open the floor for questions. I don't, if you have any, you can raise your hand in the chat or even just ask them. We're not so many today. Either. May I ask a question? Sure. Mm -hmm. Hi, thanks for the presentation. I have a question on the on the beam energy spread. Ah, yeah. I, I, I guess in uh, in slide ten, if I'm not wrong, you show a, a, yeah. a number for the uh, beam uh, resolution, uh, I guess is uh, 0.1 percent. Yes. I, I wonder uh, um, how, how realistic is going uh, below this value, especially for the uh, multi-TV regime. Um, so okay. I and there are two, uh, two parts to that. Okay. To first order, we, okay, physics might demand being better, and then we would have to see what to do. But this energy spread is part of our way to achieve luminosity. Okay. And so just to understand what we get is a phase space from in the longitudinal from the production that is given here. It's the, the longitudinal emittance. It's 7.5 MeV meters. So that means the product of energy spread and bunch length makes this value. So if I take here the, the 1.07 uh, millimeters and I multiply with one per mil of 7 TV, I end up at 7.5 MeV meters. OK, so, so this is a constant. And what we try to do is we try to make our ring accept large energy spreads so that we can make the bunch length short. And that in turn allows us to make the beta function small. And the beta function determines the size of the waste. If the beta function is small, the waste is short. That's why the bunch needs to be short. But it is also small transversely. And what this achieves is, if you look down in the uh, last row, that the beam size in the collision point actually decreases linearly with energy. You can see that here from 3 micron to 0.6. And so if you would want to have a smaller energy spread, we could do that, but it would typically reduce the luminosity. I see. But 
maybe <laughs> if you find something uh, interesting uh, to have, uh, I mean, some, some uh, very narrow resonance at uh, high energy, maybe could be interesting also to consider some run with, uh, mm -hmm. with uh, uh, smaller resolution, maybe some less uh, luminosity. Yeah. So yes, you are considering even this question. possibility. Mm. Yeah, if you could make a parameter set for a specific scan. I see. Uh, we would have to think a little bit how what the best method would be to achieve that, the most efficient mm -hmm. one which compromises luminosity. Yeah, least. I, I understand. But uh, we, could, <laughs> we could start thinking about that. It would be nice to know which order of magnitude we are talking yeah, yeah, for yeah. the energy spread. I mean, yeah, yeah. Um, a factor 10, maybe yes, uh, then it becomes mm -hmm. really tough, I would say. So I see. So uh, it's doable a factor 10, uh, uh, we compromise with luminosity. That is my gut feeling, yes. I, I see. Um, Thank yeah, you. If you need a scan, I mean, um, yeah. No, you're looking for resonances that are really narrow. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and so it's a production rate that you would want to increase. It's not distinguishing to threshold uh, to uh, resonances or with both. Okay. But because the optimization for maximizing the rate would be worrying about the, um, the folding the bright Wigner from the production mm -hmm. with whatever we have as a spectrum. While the other one would have to distinguish two different right wingers or something that are closed closely related so so there you you would not accept tails and the one and the first one you, you would be willing to have something which has tails but a narrow peak somewhere and in the other case you you, you probably don't want tails but okay so, so if you get some more information we might think about that okay th thank you very much can i ask a question mm -hmm. uh, so why did, why muon collider starts at three TeV? Uh, so does it make sense to make muon colliders at lower energies? Um, it <laughs> ends a little bit. So a part of the answer is shown here. Now this is luminosity per beam power as a function of center of mass energy. And now the total power consumption is certainly not directly. I mean the the, the, the factor between beam power and total power consumption is not the same for the two. It might be lower for the muon collider, hopefully. But you see that the muon collider at high energies profits from this increasing luminosity per power. Well, linear colliders doesn't do that. At lower energies, it is harder for the muon collider to achieve the luminosities that we want. And so you could imagine that you would do this like say there were a Higgs factory. And after the Higgs factory, 250 GV, you, you want to go to higher energies. Maybe you want only to go to one TV first. Yeah, you could consider a muon collider because of its promises at high energies, you would say. I compromise at the lower energy because I already developed the technology for the high energy and maybe I can reuse the equipment. But otherwise, below three TV, there are competitive technologies. I mean, click is in my mind feasible and has a certain cost. And if you go below um, 500 GV or so, <coughs> and the ISC and FCCE become uh, also viable options and they are more mature. So, so we, it's like you're a newcomer and you, you try to go where the, the experience established professionals are. You would only do that if they don't move, like if the ISC and FCCE, if both were not built in a reasonable amount of time, then you might consider a muon collider at low energies and you say, yeah, you compromise. There is a reason to study muons specifically. For example, we know that there is new physics in muons because of G minus two or, or because of uh, the- if there, is a, if there is a case where you need muons explicitly and you're willing to accept that the luminosity is maybe not as high as with the E plus and minus collider, Absolutely, no, no, it can be done. There is nothing wrong with going to lower energies. It's just that compared to typical physics, we would not uh, be so competitive anymore. Yeah, actually it would be interesting to know about a specific case at lower energies because 
I think that is something that is really important for us. In reality, we all know that we need a test facility, and we, we, that's why we put it, um, put it down here. In this test facility, okay, I, I made once an estimate. The test program probably will be half a billion. Not in one go, but this is derived on the principle that you need to spend a certain fraction of the project before you can actually launch into the project. Otherwise, you, you are not certain enough. So this integral over the test program, and not just this facility here, but the, the, the whole 10 years or so, needs to be reasonably expensive. And if that can have a physics case, it would be so enormously helpful. Absolutely. So please volunteer. We will actually have a workshop on uh, test facility opportunities the end of this month on the 24, 25 of uh, March. So if you want to suggest something, contact uh, me or Roberto Lusito directly and we, we can try to see if something can be integrated still in the program. Thanks. I see one more raised then. Maybe we can take this one last question and then move on to the next. Thank you, Adam. Uh, I, just in response to the comment, uh, is the test facility energetic enough to make tau's? Could you do mu to tau processes? Um. So you think about a collider at a few GV, what would be necessary to get reasonable rates, I, I guess, right? I, so, I'm a theorist, so I'm asking a, what is experimentally surely a very stupid question, but since it's difficult to make tau's in the initial state, mm -hmm. if you want to do tau to mu lepton flavor violation, I'm just asking the sort of silly question, is it easier to do mu to tau? So, so you would need the uh, center of mass energy of corresponding just to the threshold for the tau pair production. Mu plus mu minus to tau plus to ma tau minus, right? But, but for tau, you don't need the Vium collider. You could have it uh, from the B factory, current B factory. But I don't need to make tau tau bar. I don't want to make a tau and watch it decay. I want to, for instance, do mu to tau on a target, for instance. On a target, okay. Um, that, I, I would not know which energy you need for that um, to have a reasonable rate. If somebody would know, uh, please suggest um, uh, yeah if there is interesting physics in that um, I don't know you probably need quite some energy yes okay thank you okay <laughs> we have to think about that question yes <laughs> yeah. actually uh, maybe a related one for, for the measurement of the lifetime of the moon. Is that still relevant or not? But the lifetime of the muon is measured very precisely. So how can you how can you compete? In, uh... No, no, sure, sure. It's just because there were measurements on uh, the the influence of the gamma factor. I mean, just showing that it worked as predicted. So okay. No, I was assuming that probably it doesn't matter anymore. Uh, the high energies. Okay. Okay, so but mu to tau in the target. Okay. Okay, so so please, if you happen to think of something unconventional that maybe can be done with a smaller part of the facility, please volunteer that, and uh, we are going to to try to figure out if it can be integrated. And you might want to attend this workshop. Um, I can add a link to the workshop in my um, slides before I send them. 